This is a special presentation of Wink Television, a manatee emergency. Good evening, everyone. I'm Patrick Comer. Since March 5th, we've all been watching in quiet horror at the almost daily news reports of dead manatees being discovered in the waters of southwest Florida. Since March 5th, more than 150 dead manatees have been found. This is a tragic event unparalleled in scientific history. And tonight, we take you behind the nightly news reports. This is the story of efforts to save one of Florida's few remaining native residents, the manatee. There are many myths and misunderstandings about the manatee, where they come from, how many exist, and how they coexist. There are four different species of manatees in the world. There are the West Indian, the West African, the Amazon, and the Dugan. Because these are the West Indian, or better known as the Florida manatees. Researchers know the most about the Florida manatees, or West Indian manatees, that live off the coast of Florida, eastern Mexico, and the northern coastal areas of South America. And even though many people are making efforts to save Florida manatees, other species are still hunted in parts of the world. For example, the Amazonian manatees live in the canals and rivers of Brazil where they are hunted for food. The West African manatee is native to the west coast of Africa. It looks similar to the manatee we are most familiar with, but researchers don't know very much about them either. And the same goes for the Dungong, another type of manatee that exists in the Indo-Pacific region north of Australia. And imagine this 13-foot manatee doubled in size, and that is the size of stellar sea cow, a species that was hunted to extinction within 27 years of their discovery in 1741. Stellar sea cows could weigh up to three and a half tons. They lived in the Arctic waters of the Bering Straits. If you look at their mouth, it looks like the short version of an elephant trunk. Despite the popular myth that manatees are related to cows, hence the name sea cows, it's not true. Marine mammal experts say elephants are their closest land relatives. Their skin is like an elephant skin. They have, they have very small eyes like elephants. They close more like a shutter of a, of a camera lens. But unlike elephants, manatees rarely travel long distances in herds. Many have suggested that because manatees are big, slow, lumbering creatures that appear to not get out of the way of boats, that they're dumb. Not so say the experts. They say manatees are actually pretty smart. They're not dumb animals. They're extremely clever. They're, they're great geographers. They know exactly where the power plants are and the freshwater sources are. And Researchers believe such knowledge is learned by manatees when they are still calves. The long-term bond is between a mother and a calf, and, and that only lasts a year to two years. And the calf will follow the mom around. Learn. And apparently listen. Yes, manatees do apparently communicate. The sounds they make are not unlike that of dolphins. And each one of them has, a, has their own little call. And so the mom can identify the calf, and the calf can identify the mom. How detailed their calls are, marine biologists still aren't sure. Whether there's, there's a call for great seagrass or uh, tasty water or, or a boat coming, I don't know. But you do see concerted efforts uh, to get away from boats. You see one, one smash their tail on the top of the water and they all scatter. But no matter how smart they are, they still have trouble avoiding boat traffic. The problem is speed, because the boat puts out a noise that the, the manatee can recognize it probably about 100 yards away. What are you going to do? If you're an animal, you're in four feet of water, and you draw two and a half feet, and the boat draws two and a half feet. Those animals hit the bottom, but sooner or later, they're going to get hit by the boat. It seems that manatees are being forced to eat in these shallow waters. Biologists believe manatees would rather eat in deeper waters, but that's no longer an option in most places. This is a manatee in the clear spring waters of Homosassa Springs north of Tampa. And this is a manatee in the murky waters of southwest Florida. Many believe the difference is the result of pollution, runoff from fertilizers and other chemicals. The problem is that Manatees used to be able to eat seagrass in deeper water, in, in water deeper than six feet, and so it wouldn't be a problem. But with all the nutrient runoff, what it does is stimulate phytoplankton growth in the water column. And so the phytoplankton blocks out the light, and so seagrass can't grow deeper than about six feet anymore. Some have suggested that a lack of seagrass may be contributing to the unprecedented die-off of manatees in southwest Florida this year. They argue lack of food creates a weakened manatee, 
and a susceptible immune system. All of the more than 150 manatees that have died since March 5th in our waters have had pneumonia. But so far, marine biologists say it doesn't appear that it's the pneumonia that is killing the manatees. So what is killing them? When we come back, we'll take a look at some of the theories. Marine mammal experts have been deluged with ideas from the public on what's killing the manatees. With the death toll now higher than ever before in recorded scientific history, they're taking all of the suggestions seriously as they struggle to find the mysterious killer. This is the most serious die-off that I'm aware of. And probably anyone that's been doing research, since we've been doing the research, this is the most serious situation. Researchers faced what they thought was a major crisis back in 1982, when 59 manatees were reported dead in southwest Florida waters. But now, just five months into 1996, marine biologists are looking at more than 250 dead sea cows statewide and still counting, and more than 150 just in southwest Florida. That's more than the total manatee deaths of the past three years combined. It's very serious. Very serious indeed. Yeah. This is mo the most serious single die-off in the history of, of science and manatees. So, yeah, it's very serious. Right. Manatees aren't like alligators or birds or anything that lays eggs. So in those animals, you'll see a quick recovery. And so you saw alligators come off the endangered species list, and you're seeing bald eagles come off the endangered species list. The, with a mammal, you don't see quick recovery from a depleted population. Earlier this year, researchers conducted a count of Florida's manatees. They counted roughly 2,600. That's up significantly from years past. But researchers say it would be a mistake to assume that there are actually more manatees. I think we're seeing higher counts because of a number of reasons. We are better at counting animals. Uh, and, and this year we had ideal conditions to be able to count after three major cold fronts had come through and, and the wind died down and the sun was out and the animals were, were surface resting. They were easy to count. I think probably in certain places the population's been going up and, and it's a result of, of long-term efforts. But researchers and manatee lovers alike agree that the Florida manatee is a breed at risk. They're dying. There's no doubt about it. They're dying. I don't know what's killing them, but they're dying. And neither do the researchers, marine and mammal biologists, or the virologists who have been testing all different possibilities since early March. I think it's cold weather, a combination of cold weather and a red tide. Oh, it might be the red tide. It's been cold too much this winter. Now. Most folks are guessing that red tide and the unusually cold temperatures this past winter are causing manatees in southwest Florida waters to die in record numbers. And while some researchers speculate that red tide could be at least part of the cause, they still have no proof of it. As far as I know, we don't have any idea of what really is causing these animals to die. Other possibilities? Beach renourishment projects. Could they be stirring up something harmful to manatees? Or is the water so polluted now, manatees' immune systems are affected? With all the fertilizer that's, that's, that's put on people's yards and all the way through the watershed. It's, it's coming all the way from the, the middle of Florida and in and up in our bays. And it's coming from parking lots and it's coming from the, the power plants where, that are putting nitrates into the air that, that get rained into the water. So it's, yeah, human effect of, of putting additional phosphates and nitrates into the water has affected manatees. They're thinning out. They're thinning out. I saw three this morning, and that's the most I've seen in the, all this year. And biologists say we wouldn't even have the manatees we have if it weren't for earlier efforts to protect manatees by creating speed zones for boats. If, if we hadn't put in protection zones five and six years ago, we wouldn't have as many animals as we have today, and, be, and they wouldn't be able to withstand the sorts of natural mortality we're seeing down in southwest Florida. We don't think it's going to wipe out the species, uh, but it just shows how precarious uh, their position here is in Florida, and it would be a tremendous loss to lose manatees from Florida. 
Is that precarious position made more precarious by boaters? Many believe speed limits should be set for boaters and that more slow speed zones should be created. Animals know that boats are a problem. We've done studies out of, out of a blimp. Well, SeaWorld donated their blimp, ESPN cameras were on board, and we got a permit to run our boat at Manatees in, in, a, in a deep water situation up at a power plant. And at every speed, at, at slow speed, and at 20 miles an hour, and at 30 miles an hour, the animals that were surface resting made an attempt to get off the surface. But others argue that speeding boats do not pose that much of a problem for manatees, even though approximately one-fourth of manatee deaths are said to be boating related. Besides dying manatees, we've also seen large numbers of birds, catfish, stingrays, and dolphins dying. And although marine biologists say the deaths don't appear to be related to one another, it's enough to make you wonder, are we somehow messing up our environment? It also leaves the marine biologists perplexed over what's killing the manatees. When we come back, we'll take you behind the scenes and show you just some of what's being done to save manatees. Researchers say they've had far too many dead manatees to examine lately. And while they have found a few similarities in the deaths, they say they still have more questions than answers. So they decided to try something a little bit different. They set out to capture, test, and release live, healthy manatees. Scott's going to go up to do this, <laughs> to do this recon of the areas, and we're going to establish Later. the two-way. On this day, groups from SeaWorld and several county, state, and federal agencies are looking to collect blood samples from healthy manatees. The effort is an important one. Very important, because all the animals we've had up to this point have already been dead. We haven't had any sick animals reported, so we haven't had those to work with. So the next best thing is presumably healthy or maybe potentially sick live animals. So that's why we've taken these samples. But to get blood samples, live manatees have to be captured. Researchers start by picking out choice areas for capturing manatees. Herds are spotted and marked on a map. Oh, this, oh. this one, I had it just for the 60, I need a 20 in this one. 20? Here, you need a 20? Thank you. While herds are located from the air, veterinarians from SeaWorld prepare their medical kits for the samples they'll be taking. Basically doing every kind of sampling we possibly can without being invasive to the animals. Those, those are exposed. Those are exposed. Yeah. And sandy. That, that may be a better... You say you did see animals up there. Yeah. Our depths are pretty reasonable, seven foot. Once the location is settled on, the capture boats are launched. A herd has been spotted in a canal where researchers believe they can relatively easily capture them. Uh, it's a land set, which means that we set net on land and run out around the animals. We'll drive some animals toward the net and then bring the boat back to land so that it's the safest not only for us but for the manatees. When the net is set, three swimmers enter the canal at the end to drive the manatees into the net. As the net is drawn in, several large snook are also trapped. Most of the snook are eventually revived and released. The net's floats dip as manatees try to escape. Coming to you guys. At first, they think they have only captured a few manatees, but soon it's obvious they have captured several, creating a dangerous situation for man and manatee. Here we got now they have to make sure none of the manatees drown before they can be tested and released. There's some little ones underneath. Can you get them out? Hold up. We didn't take a breath. We didn't take a breath. Eventually, this little guy is briefly put on land where he'll be safe for the time being. On shore, onlookers gather to watch the excitement. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> one by one, the thousand pound plus manatees are hauled up onto the capture boats for testing. Grab a needle out of that box. By the end of the day, seven manatees are captured, six are tested, and all are released unharmed, but probably wiser. The researchers say the manatees probably learn how to go under or over a net the next time, but they say the day was a success.
captured seven animals. We were able to get blood samples from six of those, uh, and we think it went very well. We're going to use these blood samples to tell us what animals might have been exposed to and possibly use them to isolate material from blood. So it's a pretty important sample. Other ongoing efforts have been made to save this endangered species by satellite tracking from this Department of Environmental Protection Center in St. Petersburg. We started a, a tagging project where we put satellite transmitters on animals and, and start to pick up three to four locations a day off the weather satellites. At any one time, 10 to 15 manatees are carrying transmitters on Florida's west coast. The radio transmitter in the tag gives biologists a sense of where the animals travel and spend their time. When we get those locations on a daily basis, we can then send field crews out to hone in on those animals, find out exactly where they are, what sorts of habitat they're in, how many other animals they're associating with, whether they've had a calf, whether their calf's still with them. This chart shows two female manatees that swim in Lee County waters, Debbie and Zephyr. The lines show where they swim, get fresh water, feed, and even how long they stay in any particular area. And here's another tagged manatee you might remember, Sweet Pea, the wayward manatee that ended up in Texas earlier this year. SeaWorld rescuers flew Sweet Pea back to Florida where she underwent rehabilitation at Homosassa State Park. At Homosassa, Sweet Pea was tagged and put back in the wild. Researchers say satellite tracking is an important element in the effort to save manatees, but they say it wouldn't be possible without the money received from manatee specialty license plates. The manatee license tag is what drives our program. We get about 1.3 to 1.4 million dollars a year from, from the auto tags to do research and management. That's almost 50 percent of our budget. The other 50 percent comes from um, a part of the motorboat uh, licensing fee and from voluntary contributions. But without the, the license tag, we wouldn't be able to do uh, satellite tagging. We wouldn't be able to do computerized mapping. We'd have enough money to pick up the dead ones and figure out what was killing them. That's all we'd be able to do. The tissue and blood samples were sent off to several laboratories in the United States and even in Europe. Unfortunately, they revealed no conclusive evidence as to what's killing the manatees. When we come back, we'll take a look at the future of Florida manatees. Can they survive both the encroachment of man and natural disasters? As Florida's people population increases, Florida's manatee population will likely find it increasingly difficult surviving. It is also getting more and more difficult for marine biologists who are trying to save the manatees. The rescue of, of manatees can be problematic in that you may end up with an animal that, that you have to support for the rest of its life in captivity. Uh, and is there enough money to do that? It can cost thousands of dollars a year to feed and care for a manatee, and right now, there are only so many places that will accept the responsibility to care for a manatee for life. So in the future, researchers may have to get more selective about which manatees are saved. If there's 2,500 of them or, or 3,000 of them, do you spend your money that way or do you spend it on studying healthy wild animals, re rehabilitating animals that, that are, are recoverable? You, you've got to apportion your money to get the most return for the, for the population of wild animals. Sadly, baby manatees may not be the best choice to save. If they haven't been with their mother to learn where to feed and where to find fresh water and warm water, it's unlikely they'll be able to survive back in the wild. But Weigel says there are good candidates to save. Prime examples are, are animals that have been caught up in, in crab traps that have a rope wrapped around their flipper. Almost all those animals can be rehabilitated and released back out into the wild. But the odds appear to be increasingly stacked against the wild manatee population. Not all of these animals can make the transition from a captive lifestyle to the wild. You don't have a real high success rate on animals that are, are hit by boats. A few of them survive, but most of them die in captivity after they're brought in for rescue. The, the real problem is in orphans. 
animals that have been abandoned by their moms for some reason that are brought into captivity. Over the years, rescue facilities have gotten really good at saving those animals. And so now, they're up to their gills in, in orphan calves, and they have to either be released into the wild or maintained for the rest of their lives. That's a responsibility that can become very costly. And at $30,000 a year per animal, you could send them to college. <laughs> See, he's eating. So researchers are constantly facing difficult questions. Who is going to go, want to go out there and, and say to the public, no, I don't want to rescue that animal? It's going to be tough. I mean, who's going to go out and euthanize uh, a, a ba little baby manatee that has no chance of surviving in the wild long term. So far that is a decision that has not had to be made. But there are other issues to consider in the equation of what it will take to save manatees. Much of it boils down to education. Well I think manatees will survive if humans are consistent. If, if we say manatees are an important resource that we want to survive in Florida and say okay within a band along the shoreline to yet be determined, if we operate our boats in a safe and consistent manner, mantis can learn to adapt to that. They've already survived through the reckless years. And so if, if we're just consistent in our operation of motor boats and in our discharge of, of nutrients into the water column and, and work to improve ourselves, they'll respond to it. If we hadn't put in protection zones five and six years ago, we wouldn't have as many animals as we have today and, be, and they wouldn't be able to withstand the sorts of natural mortality we're seeing down in Southwest Florida. You can cut down on human-related mortality. You can't cut down on natural mortalities. And so what you have to do is, is give not only manatees, but, but fish species and, and, and dolphins, a chance in the area that, that they have to use to make a living. One of the best places in the state to really get a good view of manatees is at Homosassa Springs. These clear natural spring waters are about an hour and a half north of Tampa. Now, you won't be able to get in the water like we were permitted to do here to be able to shoot some underwater video, but you can get a good view of the manatees from above ground at observation decks and through windows underwater. Grandpa! There you will be able to clearly see and learn about manatees. But imagine being able to do this. Actually come nose to nose with a manatee. It's a rare and unforgettable experience I enjoyed. We'll have to leave it to the scientists and the researchers to find whatever it is that is killing the manatees. So far, much of the evidence, though still inconclusive, points to red tide as being at least partly to blame for the deaths. And if it is naturally occurring red tide, there may not be much we can do about it. But here's what we can do. To save manatees, we can use common sense when power boating out on the water. And we can limit the amount of fertilizers and pesticides we use in our yards because some of that will eventually run off into the water. If we treat the water like we're going to swim in it, drink it, and eat the fish that come from it, we'll probably be more careful with this finite resource. And if we are, our children and our children's children will also be able to swim with the manatees. For all of us here at Wink News, I'm Patrick Comer. Thanks for watching.